This is Laurel Mildred from the California Collaborative for Long-Term Services and Supports. And joining me is Kevin Printival, Deputy Director of the National Senior Citizens Law Center, who's here to talk a little bit about the importance of consumer protections in a high-performing system of long-term services and supports. Thank you, Laurel. The Department of Healthcare Services is currently working to design a proposal to integrate all medical, behavioral, and long-term services and supports, also known as LCSS, into managed care health plans. For dual eligibles, this will mean bringing together all Medicare and Medi-Cal services, including the LTSS services, into a single plan benefit package. The effort to integrate care brings both great promise and risk. Implemented with the beneficiary at the center, the new models that are being developed could improve care, decrease unnecessary institutionalizations and hospitalizations, and slowly bend the cost curve in California's health system. But implemented with just those cost savings goals in mind, they risk creating new barriers to accessing LTSS and other medical services and creating new financial incentives for limiting care provided to this really high needs complex group of individuals. So to ensure that the focus of new models stays on beneficiaries, strong consumer protections must exist as we build these new models and policies. Now it's important to avoid thinking of consumer protections as just a separate set of rules and requirements that are distinct from the policies that drive the system generally. Uh, enrollees are best served if consumer protections are incorporated at every level of the process, from model design and development to implementation to plan readiness to evaluation. Consumer protections can take many forms. Some protections guarantee an explicit right or service to enrollees. Other protections require or prohibit specific policies and practices of the integrated model or the integrated plan. Still other protections are implicit, incentivizing behavior of the plan that ultimately protects the individuals that are enrolled in it. Each of these protections is important and none is sufficient alone. Now we're able to group protections into a few categories that I'm going to try to cover quickly today. The first and most important is that individuals that enroll in these new integrated plans retain their right to choose how, where, and from whom they receive their care. Choice begins with a truly voluntary opt-in enrollment system where individuals are electing themselves to join these new integrated models. Choice also includes the ability of individuals to self-direct their care once in a model just like they can in the IHSS program today. Another important principle of consumer protection is the inclusion of all Medicaid and Medicare services using clear standards building off of what exists today for who can get what care when. This is important so that when individuals are denied access to care, they have some standard they can use to appeal to try to get access to those services if they think that they're necessary. That protection relates to the next important protection, which is that individuals have strong appeal rights and a strong grievance process that they can use when they're not satisfied with the care that they've received from their plan. We can build off of the strong appeal rights that exist in the Medicare and Medi-Cal systems today, but they need to be there. The more integrated they can be, the better off for the consumer. A number of other consumer protections that are key include continuity of care, that individuals retain access to the providers they see now to the treatments and services that they're currently receiving as they enter any new plan and can adjust to that plan's model for delivering care. Individuals must also receive meaningful notices and other communication about their choices. They must receive services and interact with a plan in a way that's culturally and linguistically appropriate and guarantees their physical accessibility to services. It's very important that individuals have a broad network of providers to choose from including providers that have expertise in the issues that dual eligibles and people with LTSS needs are most likely to need. Oversight of these programs must be comprehensive. It must be coordinated across state agencies and with the federal government to make sure that the plans that are part of the model are performing the required elements per contract and statute. And finally, the last two points are particularly important. One is that payment structures be designed to promote delivery of optimal care and not reward the denial of needed services. We have not in the past provided LTSS services through a managed care plans, so it's important that we make modifications to the way that we set rates for plans and providers to make sure that the incentive exists to provide good care. 
And the final point is that since this is a new level of integration, dealing with a new population, combining two different payers, and bringing together lots of different systems into one benefit package, we must proceed slowly. We must figure out what works and what doesn't before we take models to new populations and new regions in the state. Thanks for sharing this information, Kevin. If you'd like to learn more about other issues that impact long-term services and supports, if you'd like to hear more podcasts of this nature, or if you have any comments or questions, please visit www.gacinstitute.org or call 916-966-6640.